Good afternoon. Welcome to talk. I get the privilege today of doing a short introduction for our speaker, uh, and, uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhold. And because I've made tests in every other class I do this week, uh, this will be in the form of a multiple choice question. <laughs> Catherine Hayhold is a climate scientist with over 120 peer reviewed papers. Highest standard for um, for writing. B. A bachelor's wife. C. A professor at Texas Tech University. D. An MK. E. Evangelical Christian. Or F. All of the above. I think everybody knew the answer to that question. <laughs> So I am also from Toronto, and I went to school at the University of Illinois. So I think I have driven through or past Spring Arbor on I-94 probably about a million times. In fact, I have, I have probably seen some of you at the gas station at the same time, possibly, because that's the only reason I usually stop in Jackson. In fact, Jackson is kind of scary because you know there's that stretch of highway where it says, do not get out of your car. Yeah, you know that stretch. So usually we kept on driving through that part and stopped a little bit later. And then after graduating from Illinois, uh, we, were, we lived in South Bend, Indiana for a couple of years. And so we kept on driving right down 94 that whole time. So in a way, I feel like I'm very familiar with you where you live, even though I'm far away now. I live in West Texas. But thanks to the miracle of the Internet, I can be with you here today. So I'm going to share some slides with you. Let me just make sure that you can see them. Here we go. Okay. All right, now would you mind giving me a thumbs up there, people in the front row, if you can see the slides? Yes, and you can hear me too? Thumbs up still? Thank you. If there's ever a problem because I'm muted, the best thing to do is all of you in the front row, just start going like this. If I see the whole front row going like this, I'll know that there's a problem. So this is, this is the day when you stop and you think about issues. And the, one of the biggest issues that you're thinking about is the issue of risk today. And that's a big issue. We think about that all the time. Whatever your career ends up being, thinking about risk will be a big part of it. Thinking about risk is one of the biggest transitions, too. When we start buying a house, getting insurance for our car, uh, when you start having kids and you think about having a will, Figuring out our contingency plan when the unexpected or sometimes the inevitable happens is part of being a human on this planet. We cope with risk every day. What I'm going to talk about today, though, is how we humans are tipping the natural balance of risk in this world. So just to make sure. Did the slides change? Can you now see an earth rather than my title slide? Give me a thumbs up there in the front row. All right, it looks like we're good, thank you. I study this planet that we live on. And often we tend to think of the planet as almost this you know, pristine, untouched globe, just the way God created it. And this is the way our planet looks if you take a picture of it during the day. But over the last few thousand years, we've gone from a very small number of people to almost seven and a half million people in the world today. That's a lot of people. And so today, I think a more accurate way to look at our planet is not by taking a picture of it during the day, if you were an astronaut on the International Space Station, for example, but taking a picture of it as some of those astronauts have at night. Because if you look at the planet at night, you can literally see with your eyes where people live. And in fact, if we zoom in on the United States and we look at a picture of the United States at night from space, we can see, and hopefully you guys are seeing now, uh, we can see lights of cities. You can actually, if you look really carefully, you can see I-94 on this map. You see I-94? Isn't that crazy? We can see the impact that we humans are having on this planet. We can see how many of us there are. Again, over almost seven and a half billion of us, 
spread across this world. So we have huge cities all along our coastlines. Did you know that two thirds of the world's biggest cities are along low lying coastlines within just a few feet of sea level? We have allocated every acre of arable land on this planet. This is what arable land looks like where I live now. But I have to say, living on the border of Indiana and Michigan, what I enjoyed most was all of the orchard. You can go pick your own fruit. But whatever the land is, if you can grow something on it, it is divided up and it's owned by somebody because we have so many people. And we already know that we don't have enough to go around. I was recently out in California and in California, they're coming out of a really severe drought. And during that drought, this cartoon is a little bit of a joke, but not totally a joke because there just wasn't enough water to go around. So we've already allocated huge amounts of land, of um, farmland, of water, and yet the number of people on this planet keep growing. There's this concept called planetary boundaries. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a really interesting concept and there's a great one hour video on YouTube if you're interested in finding out more about planetary boundaries. Basically the idea is, is that there are limits to the carrying capacity of our planet and there's several different factors that are causing us to push many of those limits. So there's some websites that you can go to, and this is one that I did myself just last week. There's websites you can go to where you enter your lifestyle. So we're talking about how big is the house we live in, how much food do we eat each week, and how much of that is meat versus vegetables, how much do we travel, how much water do we consume, what our lifestyle looks like. And so you enter your lifestyle and you know, my lifestyle is, is pretty good. I mean, you know, I, I live in a smallish house. Um, you know, we eat, you know, a good variety of foods local when we can get it. Um, we're pretty conservative with, you know, turning off the lights, not using too much water. We don't even water our lawn. So I'm, I'm filling out the survey thinking how many planets does it take to support my lifestyle? Well, you know, probably a little bit, you know, more than one, but not that bad. Well, it turns out you should do this for yourself. Turns out my lifestyle, if every single person on the planet, all 7.4 billion of us, had my lifestyle, it would take five planets to support the world's population. And obviously we don't have five planets. Not only that, but it would take about 23 acres of land to generate all of the products, not just food, but the types of products that I use in my life. And currently, there's only been an average of one or two acres of arable land per person on the planet. So the carrying capacity of our planet is already exceeded and that puts us at risk because already some of us are using way too much and others are using way too little. And that's just not fair. I mean, the story this makes me think of is in the book of Corinthians where Paul writes to them and he says, I know that every time you celebrate the Lord's Supper, you're having a meal together, which is great. Everybody's bringing food and everybody's eating together. But I've heard that some of you are arriving early and you're eating up all the food and you're drinking up all the drink. And when the poor people who've been laboring all day arrive later on to partake of the supper, there's only crumbs left. That's kind of similar to what we're doing today. And Paul's conclusion was very similar too. He said, so next time you have this potluck dinner, wait for each other. Make sure everybody gets the fair amount. Not there's a few of you come early who hog everything and you just leave the crumbs for other people. It isn't an issue of too many people on the planet. It's an issue of not fairly allocating our resources to the people that we have. And that puts us at risk. There's another way that we're at risk though too. Now, what you're looking at here is just kind of a picture, a schematic of, of our weather. You know, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's dry. But our civilization, our society, our infrastructure is founded on an assumption that we hardly ever think about. And that is the assumption that sure, we might have crazy hot weeks in the summer, we might have insane winter storms in the winter, we might have really wet periods and droughts in between, but our society is based on the assumption that it all averages out. That is the assumption that governs how we build our roads and our bridges. 
who lives in a flood zone and who doesn't? How big an air conditioner or a furnace we need for our house? What our bills are gonna look like on average? What type of crops we go in cer certain places of the world? We assume that you know we get these crazy ups and downs all the time. That's just part of the natural cycles of life on this planet. And when we get especially high or especially low, that's a risk that we face too. Droughts are a huge problem where I live. Floods are a bit even bigger problem in the Midwest. These are part of the natural cycle of life and they, they are risks, risks that we buy insurance against often. But our society is based on the assumption that over long periods of time, 20 to 30 years, it all averages out. Here's the thing though, what happens if this assumption isn't valid anymore? What happens if we build our houses for a certain type of climate and all of a sudden we're living somewhere that's a lot warmer, a lot drier than where we built our house for? What happens if they're, restart, they're have, having to redraw the flood zones because their heavy rainfall events are increasing as they are in Michigan, they've increased about 45% across the entire Midwest. What happens if the types of crops that we're used to growing, again, this is what it looks like in my backyard here in Texas, what happens if the types of crops we're used to growing can't grow in those places anymore? And what happens if things like our state water plan, for example, are based on the drought of record that happened 50 years ago, but we're actually seeing droughts now that are worse than that drought of record. So our, our whole state isn't prepared for what's coming. That begs the first question. I'm gonna ask and answer three questions today. The question is, is this happening? So is the assumption that all of our society and our economy is built on, our energy planning, our water planning, our agriculture planning, as well as many of our personal choices and decisions, is this assumption valid? Or is our climate actually changing? Which means that if we're preparing for what we've seen in the past, we won't actually be prepared for what we see in the future. So first of all, between the months of November and April, this is the number one question I get. It's freezing, are you, why are you talking about climate change? So just to be clear, I'm not talking about weather here. Weather is like what a single tree, it's like what happens in a certain place at a certain time. I'm not talking about a change in weather, that's that squiggly line that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm talking about the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. That's like looking at a whole forest of trees. If you look at a single tree, it's hard to say, you know, is this tree short or tall? I have no idea. Some trees are tall, some trees are short. But you look at the whole forest, you're like, okay, I can calculate the average height of the trees in this forest, the average age of the trees in this forest. You know, similar to looking at a, at, you know, a single person. Can, if I just picked one person, you know, out of all of Michigan, I couldn't tell a lot about them because they're just one person. But if you look at the whole state of Michigan, you have things like demographics, average age, you know, what percentage are in different races, what percentage are making in different income brackets. We can gather information that's reliable when we look at people in big groups. In the same way, we can gather information about climate when we look at weather in big groups. Years and decades worth of observations, not just in one place, but all around the world. So I'll just give you an example. On my Facebook page, I just posted recently about a study I did showing that actually droughts are getting more frequent and stronger across Texas and Oklahoma over climate timescales, which is over at least 20 to 30 years. So I post this thing on Facebook where I carefully explain how the overall long-term trend is towards longer and stronger droughts. And this lady gets on and she says, well, I don't know, because last summer was pretty wet. So here's the thing, saying, you know, it's freezing here where I live, so the planet can't be getting warmer. Or you're saying that droughts are getting stronger, but hey, it rained here where I live. It's kind of as if you were on the Titanic and you're saying, well, it can't be sinking because my end just went 200 feet up in the air. We know that you have to look at the whole ship to see if it's sinking. In the same way, we have to look at the whole big picture to see what's happening. So what we do is to see if, you know, if this wiggly line, which is still wiggly today, is it starting to kind of tilt? We look at weather stations all around the entire world, tens of thousands of weather stations around the world. And when we look at that, we see, hang on a second, this is global temperature and actually it's not really changing much, is it? And so you see these headlines 
in um, news articles that say, oh, global warming stopped, or, you know, those scientists are just faking the data. And there's a whole bunch of new headlines that just came out last week saying, scientists are, you know, putting their finger on the scale, trying to make it look as if it's warming. And they said, look, if you just look at, you know, 2000 to 2010, it really doesn't look like it's warming. Well, hang on a second, right? Go back, oops, go back to here. Climate is the long-term average of weather over what? At least 20 to 30 years. Why is it that long? It's because these squiggles, these ups and downs, they happen from day to day, from year to year, and even from about 10 to 20 years, we have these ups and downs. So you have to look over long enough time scales that we actually get an idea of the long-term trend. And when we do that, what we see, this is the same data, what we see is that, yeah, there's, you know, warmer years and colder years, but long term, it's getting warmer. And in fact, the last three years have been some of the warmest on record. If we look around the entire world, too, it isn't just thermometers. In fact, some people say, oh, well, those thermometers, you never know if they're right or not. And so I say, throw them out, get rid of the thermometers, because you can look up in the Arctic and you can see that ground that has been permanently frozen for as long as people live there is starting to thaw and melt. And people's homes like this one in Shishmaref are literally falling off the, you know, off into the ocean as the ground under their feet crumbles and erodes away as it thaws. We can go to Kyoto, Japan, where they've been keeping written records of when the cherry trees blossomed for over 1,100 years. And today, those cherry trees are blossoming an average of three weeks earlier in the year than any time in the 1,100 year history. Spring is coming earlier. We can look all around the world and see how heavy rain events are increasing. Why? Because in a warmer world, water evaporates faster. The warmer it is, the faster water evaporates. And so all of this water is evaporating out of our oceans and lakes and streams and reservoirs, the Great Lakes, the oceans, and it's sitting up there in the atmosphere. And then along comes a storm and the storm has all this extra water vapor to pick up and dump on us. We've been measuring global humidity and it's been increasing as have our heavy downpours. And lastly, in addition to looking at, you know, things like glaciers melting and different types of animals and insects and even plants moving forward as it gets warmer, you can look at how hurricanes are getting stronger because they get their energy from warm ocean water. And as the, as the ocean warms, because it isn't just the air, the ocean's warming too, as the ocean warms, it's powering stronger hurricanes. So we can throw out those thermometers, we can throw out all the scientific measurements. If we look around the world, if we look at creation, if we look at nature, there are over 26 and a half thousand natural thermometers telling us it's getting warmer. Whether it's tulips blooming earlier in the year, whether it's bird species we've never seen before moving into northern areas or moving out of areas where we live, we're seeing stuff happen all around the planet. That line isn't flat anymore. It is tilting. So then the next logical question is, well, why is this happening? Because I know, and you know too, if you've watched the Ice Age movies, I know that it's been different here in the past. I mean, there was an Ice Age, maybe we're just getting warmer after the last Ice Age. It could just be a natural cycle and then we'll get cooler soon. Or maybe it's the sun because we get most of our energy from the sun. We get a little bit from the interior of the earth, a little, little bit but most of it comes from the sun. And you know, sometimes the sun, uh, sun's energy goes up a bit, sometimes it goes down, kind of chaotic. So when we see something changing as a scientist, we have to say, could it be a natural factor like it's always been before? Anytime things have been different on the planet, it's always been because of nature, not because of us. So let's look at nature and see if it might be responsible for what we're seeing today. So this is the temperature of our Earth. I'm showing you um, what it looks like going back over 100 years here. The wiggly line is year to year. That looks familiar, right? That's just, you know, weather from year to year. But then the thick orange line is the long-term average. And you can see long-term average as it is going up. Now, if our planet were getting warmer because of the sun, does that mean that we would be getting more energy from the sun or less energy from the sun? I want you to stick your thumbs out. 
and give me a thumbs down if you think we should be getting less energy from the sun and give me a thumbs up if you think it means we're getting more energy from the sun. I can see your, uh, your hands, put them up. There we go. Okay, the front row looks like they're getting the right answer. <laughs> Everybody else, I should probably ask you to hold it up over your head. It's true. So if, if we're getting warmer because of the sun, we should be getting more energy from the sun, not less. Well, here's what the sun's energy looks like over the past hundred years. It was indeed going up from the 1900s to about the 1960s. But since the 1970s, the sun's energy has been actually going down. And the temperature of the earth has been going up faster and faster. So it can't be the sun, because if it were, we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. So then you might say, well, can't it just be a natural cycle? Now, we've got two types of natural cycles. We've got natural cycles that, that happen inside the Earth system. Those are the cycles like El Nino, which people talk a lot about in Texas, and the North Atlantic Oscillation that people talk about a lot in the Northeast that affects Northeaster storms. There's a lot of natural cycles, and that's what we climate scientists actually study. We study natural cycles. We know, though, that natural cycles inside the Earth system, they don't create or destroy heat. So if they make this area warmer, they're doing so by taking the heat from over here. If, this make, if they make this place wetter, they're doing that by taking all of the moisture from over here. So with natural cycles that are inside the Earth's system, all they do is move heat around. Warmer here, colder here, wetter here, drier here. But we know that the whole planet's warming. It isn't just the atmosphere that's warming, it's the ocean that's warming too, and the ice that's melting. So it can't be a natural cycle inside the climate system, because if it were, you can't have the whole planet warming. That would violate conservation of energy. But there is a different type of natural cycle that's outside the Earth's system. It's caused by changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. So over long periods of time, the Earth's orbit becomes more circular, and then it becomes more elliptical. And then also you know that our Earth is tilted, right, relative to, the, to the, our axis of, of rotation around the sun. And so over time, that tilt kind of precesses like a top. Have you ever taken like a children's toy, a top, and you spin it? And it's spinning really fast, but the top kind of moves around slowly. Those are the natural cycles that affect how sunlight falls on the earth. And those are the natural cycles that actually cause the ice ages. So it's a natural question to say, well, I know that we had an ice age because I watched that movie. And I know that it ended when the squirrel was chasing the nut and broke the iceberg off. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go watch the movie. That is actually not the reason why it ended. Um, but that it is true that there are natural cycles like that. And so people say, well, aren't we just warming after the last ice age? Here's the thing, though. If we look at the history of our planet, these are the last 6,000 years. Look at the last 6,000 years. Our temperature has actually, it's recovered from the last ice age. And in fact, it was on a long, slow, gradual slide into what? Into the next ice age. You know how we know? Because you can calculate using algebra and geometry how the Earth's orbit is changing and when the next ice age should be happening. It turns out that the next thing on our geologic calendar, not, you know, not next year, don't worry about that, but the next thing on our geologic calendar in a few hundred or maybe a thousand years was another ice age. There aren't any big natural cycles here. There's just this long, slow slide, and then something happened. And if you also look at carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, and we're gonna talk about those next because this is a huge clue. If you look at carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, you can see that they were pretty stable and then all of a sudden just went up like this. So we can't say that there were any big natural cycles over the last 6,000 years because there weren't. There was just a gradually, slowly cooling planet and then all of a sudden, boom, a huge warming. And when did that warming happen? Look very carefully at those years and think to yourself, what happened around that time in our history? The answer is, that it's not the sun and it's not a natural cycle causing carbon dioxide to go like this and causing our temperature to go like this. 
Natural factors have an alibi for the first time ever. The clue to what's going on is on this picture of the earth that we looked at about 15 minutes ago. But the clue is not where we were looking over in Michigan. The clue is up in North Dakota. And for those of you who are geographically challenged, I have put a nice orange box around North Dakota. What city is that that we're looking at in North Dakota? It isn't a city. Those are the lights of thousands of fracking wells that are digging oil and gas out of the ground so that we can power the Industrial Revolution. It was about 300 years ago that we figured out how to dig massive amounts of coal and then also natural gas and oil as well out of the ground and burn it. It's no coincidence that human population has grown over that time because this is what powered our development. The Industrial Revolution has brought us untold benefits. I don't know about you, but I like having a fridge. Not only is it convenient, it actually keeps our food safe. If you live in a place that does not have a fridge, you are in constant danger of eating something that has spoiled, and that can actually be very, very dangerous. It can even kill you. It's brought us electricity and lights. I mean, you're sitting in a room with lights on right now, right? Light has changed our lives. I'm, I'm sure many of you have go camping or have gone camping in the summer. I used to work as a camp counselor in the summer leading canoe trips up in Ontario. So I know what it's like to live without light and our lives are very different. Not to mention electricity and electronics and all of the things that we take for granted in our modern world today. The Industrial Revolution also revolutionized our transportation. I mean, people were using horses back then. And now we don't just have trains and trucks and cars and planes. Or, you know, we went to the moon and we're talking about going to Mars. It's crazy how life has changed in the past 300 years. And we have incredible medical advances as well. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not one of those people who really, really wants to live in one of those time traveling books where you go back a couple hundred years and you're living in a time when there is no modern medicine, um, when there was, uh, you know, very, very primitive ways to live. I enjoy the lifestyle that we have today. And that has brought us incredible benefits. But at the same time, it's brought us those benefits at a price. Remember how we were talking about how the resources in the world are not fairly distributed? One of the biggest resources, we often think about food being not fairly distributed, but one of the biggest resources we have is energy. That's what's changed our lives over the, lives over the last 300 years. And energy is not distributed fairly. Around the world, there are a billion people who don't have electricity. A billion people out of seven and a half billion. That's a huge number. And even more people don't have clean cooking facilities. Burning wood and other fuel indoors to cook kills two and a half million people a year. This is a very serious inequity. And so, so we might say, well then, isn't the fairest thing to make sure that all of those countries can use the coal and the gas and the oil that powered our development. We'll often hear many Christian leaders even saying that, saying that, you know, these people are telling us we need to stop burning this stuff because it's so dirty and polluting, but how are these people going to develop? Here's the thing. If we look at where the coal and gas and oil is around the world, and this is only a map of coal, but if you look at oil and gas, it's pretty much the same, except there's even more up in the Arctic. Where does this stuff exist? There isn't a lot of it in South America. If you go back here, look at Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Southeast Asia. These are the places that have energy poverty. So look at Latin America, look at Africa, look at Southeast Asia and India, they actually don't have fossil fuel resources. And in fact, I went and made this figure because I want to know exactly how much they have. If we look at what coal and gas and oil we have left in the world, North America has 37%, Europe has 20%, the Middle East has 20%, the, 
Then Latin America, mostly Venezuela, has about 14%. All of Africa, all of the Asia Pacific area only has 3%, 6% in Africa. They actually don't have these resources. And so saying, well, they need to use that to develop, that isn't going to fix the problem. Now, there is a solution to that, and we will get to that, but we're going to keep on talking about the problem first. The reason why people are talking about we should stop burning coal and gas and oil is for two reasons. Reason number one is that burning coal and gas and oil produces really terrible air pollution. It produces so much air pollution that 3 million people around the world die every year because of air pollution from burning fossil fuels. So two and a half million die from burning um, wood and other types of fuel inside for cooking. And 3 million die every year because of air pollution from burning fossil fuels. 200,000 in the United States every year. Now picture this, imagine that Domestic terrorism killed 200,000 people in the United States every year. We'd be in a very different situation, I think. So why, why do we never hear about this? Why do we never think about this? It's because we've gotten used to it. It's been happening for 300 years. And burning fossil fuels has brought us all kinds of benefits, like I talked about, incredible benefits. But at the same time, now we know that burning fossil fuels doesn't just pollute the air. It does something else. What you're looking at here is you're looking at the steam coming out of a smokestack. It's just water vapor. What you can't see here are the heat trapping gases, specifically carbon dioxide, that is produced when we burn coal, gas, and oil because those contain carbon. When you burn them, the carbon combines with oxygen and produces carbon dioxide. This is how much of the stuff we've produced since the 1800s, quite a bit. Why do we care about this thing called carbon dioxide? You can't see it, you can't smell it, it doesn't produce smog, it's not dangerous to breathe. So why is this thing so important? It's important because, hopefully you're gonna be able to see this little video here when I play it. When I start playing the video, if you guys in the front row, please give me a thumbs up if you see the video playing, okay? Give me, go like this if you don't, all right? You don't, you're not gonna hear anything, you're just gonna see it. We care about carbon dioxide because our planet already has a natural blanket of carbon dioxide. Awesome, I see you can see this little blanket. It's a natural blanket of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases. The sun's energy shines down and goes right through this blanket like a window, the Earth heats up and gives off heat energy, but this blanket traps the Earth's heat and it keeps us 60 degrees Fahrenheit than we would be otherwise. Our planet would be a frozen ball of ice if it wasn't for this incredible God-given blanket that we have. This blanket is what makes it possible to have life on Earth. So if it's a natural blanket, then what's the problem? The problem is when we burn coal and gas and oil, we're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, a blanket it never needed. And just when I used to, like when I used to stay at my grandma's house when I was little and she would sneak in and put an extra blanket on me when I was sleeping and I would wake up sweating saying, grandma, I never needed this blanket. That's what's happening to our planet. We're wrapping an extra blanket around it that it never needed. And our planet is heating up. You can find this little video on my Facebook page if you want to see it again or show anybody. But here's something that you won't find in the video, and that is the fact that we've known this stuff for a really long time. Often we'll hear people saying these days, well, you know, it could be real or maybe it isn't. It could be human or it could be a natural cycle. We should just study this for more time. And that sounds very responsible, right? I mean, clearly you don't want to, you know, um, start making sweeping changes in the way we get our energy if we're not quite sure yet, right? Here's the thing though. How long have we known about the natural blanket that our planet has that keeps us at just the right temperature for life? We've known about that since the days of this guy on the far left, Fourier, in the early 1800s. How long have we known that burning coal and gas and oil wraps an extra blanket around the planet? since Tyndale in the 1850s. 
Yes, 1850s. That's how long we've known about this extra blanket. How long have we known how fast the earth will warm when we wrap this extra blanket around it? The guy in the middle, Arrhenius, he won a Nobel Prize for physical chemistry. And in his spare time on his weekends, he built the first climate model by hand using basic physics from the 1890s. And he calculated how fast the earth would warm if we doubled or tripled the thickness of this blanket over our planet. And he was right. Guy Callender, his name actually is Guy, the guy on the, on the right side there, Guy was the first person to add up the temperature from weather stations all around the world and to show that, yeah, it actually is warming. And he published his work in 1938. And then Charles Keeling at the end started to actually measure how thick this heat trapping blanket was. He has a long-term monitoring station set up on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, which you can still see if you go there today. We are at risk because remember what I was talking about before? Our socioeconomic system, our energy, our buildings, our roads and bridges, our water planning, our food planning, all of that is built on the assumption that we have ups and downs, cold and hot, wet and dry, but it all averages out in the end. And it isn't averaging out anymore. It's changing quickly. And so if we plan for the future based on the past, we're going to end up in a very different place than we thought we did. And that just isn't safe. It's very risky. Why do we care? Here's a good question. Why do we care about this issue? If you were asked to design a movie poster or a book cover for a book or a movie about global warming or climate change, nine out of 10 people, I bet, would pick the same type of image for that poster or that book cover. I'll give you a clip. The image would, pick, would have something white in it, something furry, and if possible, sitting on a big piece of melting ice. What would be on the cover of that book? Probably a polar bear, right? Here's the thing though. Remember what I was just saying, climate is changing because we're burning all of this coal and gas and oil. But coal and gas and oil brought us all of the incredible benefits that we enjoy today. I don't know about you, but I want electricity. I want a car to drive. I want access to modern medicine and technology. And I do not want to go back to living in the Middle Ages. I don't. So if you're asking me to change the way, not just I live, but the way our entire world works because of the polar bear. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm Canadian. I love polar bears. But I'd say, you know, put them in a zoo. Up in Winnipeg, they have an awesome zoo with the biggest polar bear habitat in the world. Let's just give them a ton of money to make a huge polar bear habitat. We'll even give them icebergs to sit on. I mean, if that's all that matters, there's a different way to fix the problem, right? That isn't why it matters. And that's why I think that using the polar bears, the image of climate change is actually a really bad idea. Because after the polar bear, we're next. Why are we so vulnerable to a changing climate? It goes back to what I was talking about at the very beginning. Remember how I was talking about these planetary boundaries? And I don't know if you noticed at that time when I showed you, but right up there at the top, we have climate change. We have two thirds of the world's biggest cities sitting within a few feet of sea level that is rising. And you can't just pick up a big city and move it. We have every acre of arable land already allocated. And if you can't grow orchards on the land that you currently own, you can't just move up to northern Michigan and take over somebody else's land. It already belongs to them. We already don't have enough water to go around. And as it's getting warmer and water is evaporating faster out of our reservoirs and our, our fresh water systems, in some places of the world, there isn't enough water to go around. We also care about a changing climate because it's taking our natural disasters, disasters that are just part of that wiggly line, you know, disasters that happen naturally, it's taking them and it's putting them on steroids. So when we look at droughts, we still have natural droughts, but the droughts are getting stronger and longer because the warmer it is, the more water evaporates from our soil as well as from our reservoirs. 
and the droughts get stronger. Our heavy rainfalls are getting stronger because there's more water vapor sitting up there in the atmosphere for them to pick up and dump on us. And that causes flooding. Our hurricanes are getting stronger because they get their energy from warm ocean water. Why else do we care about a changing climate? This is an analysis that I did about 10 years ago, actually, for Michigan. I did one for each state in the Midwest. And we looked at what the average conditions in Michigan would be like as the world gets warmer, if we continue to depend on fossil fuels, that's the red scenario, or if we can transition off of fossil fuels to different ways of getting energy that don't produce the heat trapping blanket around their planet. And this is pretty powerful because I don't know about you, but if you live in Michigan, you live in it because it isn't Texas, right? And so people will ask me, well, what are you doing living in Texas? And I say, well, I'm just anticipating global warming. I'm down here to see what it looks like. And when it gets really bad, I'll move back. We care about it because it's changing the character of the places that we live. Now, you know, it's not like picking up the Great Lakes and putting them somewhere else. Michigan will always have the Great Lakes. But it's changing the types of plants and animals and trees that you see. It's changing um, the types of crops you can grow. It's changing how much um, air conditioning you need versus how much heating you need. It's even changing the types of bugs and pests and invasive species that we see. This is another analysis we did using the USDA hardiness zone maps. So if you're a gardener or if your mom or dad is a gardener, um, you know that on the back of seed packets, it'll tell you, you know, plant by this date if you live in this zone. So plant hardiness zones are different zones to tell you what type of plants you can plant and when you can plant them. So look at Michigan in 1990. That was where your plant hardiness zone was, dark green, right? By 15 years later, where you are right now in Michigan had changed one whole zone, one entire zone. Isn't that crazy? And as we go into the future, depending on the choices we make, if we continue to depend on fossil fuels and we produce more and more carbon, or if we can sort of ramp it back and start getting our energy from other ways, we're gonna to continue to see big changes. I mean, look at where that yellow is in central Michigan in the future. And in today, you don't have yellow until you're down into Tennessee. That's a pretty big change. We also talked about how heavy rainfall has increased. This is looking at the past 50 years. There's been a 45% increase in heavy rainfall events over the, the past 50 years across the Midwest, and that's translating it into increased flood risk. Why do we care about a changing climate, whether we live in North America or whether we live in a developing country? Floods are extremely damaging. Why do we care about a changing climate? Because whether we live in Texas, the picture on one side is from Texas, or whether we live in Syria, which experienced an incredible drought too that contributed to the refugee crisis that they're in right now, we care about drought because it affects us, it affects our food, it affects our economy. We care about a changing climate because it affects our homes that we live in. Whether you live along the coast where you're at risk from hurricanes that are getting stronger, whether you live in the Arctic where the ground under your feet is crumbling and falling into the ocean. And we care about a changing climate because heat waves are getting more frequent. Whether you live in Australia where they had to add a new color to their temperature map, that purple color is 129 degrees. And they had to add that to their temperature map because they'd never had anything that hot before. And over in India, that dark red area, it's all over 110 degrees, all of it. What happens when it's really hot? People die and go to the hospital. So we care about a changing climate because it puts us at risk. And yes, climate is missing a T there. I do see that. We're at risk because climate change is taking our natural weather risks We've always had heat waves, we've always had droughts, we've always had floods, we've always had hurricanes. It's taking our natural events and it's amping up the risk. That's why we care. We also care because when we look at who's most vulnerable, they live in some of the poorest countries in the world. These are the people who are most vulnerable. Why? They don't have insurance when it floods. They don't have crop insurance when the, uh, when the droughts come. When a disaster happens, they don't have a national guard to help people. We're at risk because people who are poor and vulnerable are disproportionately affected by a changing climate. 
We care about climate change because we can't fix all these other issues we're worried about, like hunger, poverty, water scarcity. We can't fix these other issues where people don't have enough resources if we leave climate change out of the picture. It's like pouring all of our money and our effort into this bucket and the bucket has holes in it and those holes are climate change and they're getting bigger and bigger. We have to patch the holes too if we wanna fix our other problems. And as Christians, there's more to it than just our own self-interest. There's, there's the idea that others are being harmed and we want to help them. This is the Texas translation of the Bible. It appears exclusively on road signs. We care about climate change because it affects people. Whether they don't have enough, enough food to eat, whether they don't have clean water to drink, whether they don't have access to medicine that all of us take for granted in 2017. At this point, we basically have three choices. We can cut our carbon emissions, we can prepare for a different future, and we can suffer. That's a pretty crazy word. And this is not from some, you know, from, from some Christian leader. This is actually from the president's science advisor, if you can believe it. This is what he said when it comes to climate change. But if the way to fix this problem is to cut this blanket that we're wrapping around our planet, if that's the solution, how are we going to do that? Can we really fix this problem? And that's what I want to end with is some ideas about can we fix this? One of the biggest questions that I get is, isn't it too late? Well, here's the thing. When is it too late to stop smoking? It's always a good day to stop smoking. The best time to stop smoking is today. If we can't stop today, tomorrow is the best day. When's the best time to stop producing carbon? to stop wrapping this extra blanket around our planet this year. If we can't do it this year, next year is the best time. There's always time to take action, although the window is starting to close. And so I have these little videos on YouTube. I don't know if you've seen them. They're called Global Weirding and they're just about seven minutes long each. This is the one that just came out today. And this one is about, is it too late to do something about climate change? And the answer is no, there's definitely some damages that we can't avoid, kind of like if you've been smoking for 20 years, there are some damages you can't reverse, but it isn't too late. So if you're interested in why and how and what, check out this video. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change says that we wanna prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. And to do that, we do have to stop wrapping this extra blanket around the planet. And you might say, but hang on a second. I mean, how can we do that? Because we use this stuff for almost everything we do. It's true, but today there's a different way to get our energy. And that way is what we have so much of in Texas. Rather than continuing to depend on fossil fuels, there are different ways to get energy, to keep the lights on, to keep the car running, uh, to keep powering improvements in medical technology and well-being and health, there are different ways that we can act to change our future. So I got to go to Paris last year, and it was really interesting because 195 countries around the entire world were there because they figured out it was more expensive and more risky not to do anything about this problem than it would be to actually try to fix it. So how can we fix it? It isn't a matter of just feeling guilty about, you know, every time we get, the, we get in the car, uh, we're just producing all these terrible carbon emissions and oh, isn't that awful? I mean, what can you do about that? I don't know about you, but I drive to work. Um, we can reduce our risks, and this is actually from a class I teach. Um, we can reduce our risks by reducing our vulnerability. Even though weather and climate events might be getting more risky in the future, we can work together to reduce our vulnerability and that reduces our risks. How can we do that? One way we can do it is what Chicago did. They're at risk from flooding. We did a study for them that showed that yeah, heavy rainfall is increasing. So you know what Chicago did? This is really cool. After we did the study for them, I looked at the headlines of some newspapers the next year and these were some headlines. They built new sewers. They built a massive new reservoir to help alleviate flooding. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You might say, hang on though, you're talking about Chicago, what can I do? Well, that was my last Global Weirding video. Um, two weeks ago, our video was about, I'm just one person, what can I do? 
watch this video for some really cool tips. But the bottom line is there is a lot that we can do. The first thing we can do is we can talk about it. Because you know what? Hardly anybody does talk about this issue. Often we're kind of scared to because we don't know how to start. But that's where the global weirding videos come in. They're all about these little interesting tidbits that you can start talking to somebody about without starting an argument. What else can we do? Each of us can individually measure our carbon footprint to figure out where this stuff is coming from in our lives. And we can make very common sense solutions and actions. I mean, I know that light bulbs, people talk about them a lot, but the reality is when you own your own home, I know many of you don't, but when you do, or even when you're renting your own home and you have your own light bulbs, switching to LEDs saves us money. It would save $250 billion in energy costs if everybody switched. That's a ton of money. You save about $30 up to $135 per bulb. Crazy, eh? Eating lower on the food chain. Producing beef takes a lot of carbon. You have to produce all the corn and you have to feed it to the beef and then the cows actually produce a lot of heat trapping gases like methane out their rear end. Eating meat is not the main source of a changing climate. Burning fossil fuels is, but it's definitely one of the big ones and eating lower on the food chain does help. We can encourage each other to act. And I love this online Christian community where you sign up and every month they send you an idea of what you can do. Isn't that cool? It's called climatecaretakers.org. Check it out and sign up today. We can work together, whether it's a church offering their roof to a community as a solar garden. That's pretty cool, isn't it? But the bottom line is we need to acknowledge this is a real problem, whether we live in North America or whether we live in Bangladesh. We can help others prepare like these awesome fog nets in Africa that are helping to collect some of the extra water vapor out of the air to give people water in a place where they don't have it. We can work to end energy poverty because you know what? Africa doesn't have fossil fuels. We saw that. But they have a lot of sun and a lot of wind. And putting a solar panel on a thatched roof hut is a lot easier than building a giant power plant, building all of the wires to bring that power around, and then making them buy the coal or the gas from a different country to power it. Because if you look at solar energy potential around the world, it is all across Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We can work to end energy poverty in ways that will last. We can support organizations that are doing this, like MICA Challenge, like Plant with Purpose, who works in Haiti. That's a picture of all their workers there at the bottom, Plant with Purpose, Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. There's so many organizations out there that know this and are working on it. We can tell people that we care. I work with Citizens Climate Lobby that helps people talk to their elected officials and say, hey, I care about this issue. How are you going to fix it for us? I love Citizens Climate Lobby because they have a bipartisan climate solutions caucus in Congress. They have, I think it's up to 16 um, uh, Republican congressmen and women and then the same number of Democrat congressmen and women looking for climate solutions. Pretty cool. The bottom line, though, is this. I'm gonna end with a quote from my favorite scientist, Jane Goodall. She says, it's only when our brain and our heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. And I think that applies to living out our own lives as well as to looking at how we face risk in the world we live in today. Thank you. So we got time for a few questions, I suppose. So my question is, what about the promise of nuclear energy? Because it produces no CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. as, as a chemist, I have some problems. But uh, what would be your comment? Yes, you are absolutely right. Um, nuclear does not produce CO2. Um, for some places in the world, I think it is a sensible, viable option. If if you develop nuclear technology that doesn't require cooling water, because that's a major vulnerability in a warmer world, and they've already had to shut down a lot of nuclear plants in the middle of the summer when it gets too hot, which is just when you need the electricity. If you build it in an area in a, in a technology, using a technology that doesn't need cooling water, if it's an area that is not subject to geologic risks, like tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, and if the price is right, 
because today, wind and solar energy in Texas, it's cheaper than natural gas, um, even if you take all the subsidies off. Um, so in many parts of the world, other sources are going to be cheaper. And I'm a big fan of whatever is cheapest and whatever invests most in the local economy. But I think that involves looking at the entire spectrum. Well, you know, I, I argue with uh, climate change denialists a lot, so I'm just going to go ahead and pick an opportunity to ask a question or two, because I'm dying to know the answer to some of these questions. <laughs> one, one thing I've seen from some of my friends that I, that I, I talk to is there's, a, there's this graph that shows carbon dioxide concentrations that go back 600 million years, all the way back to the beginning of the Cambrian. And it shows temperatures that go back that far as well. And you'll see CO2 levels that are as high as 7,000 parts per million. And you'll see uh, carbon dioxide levels that are quite low. And the correlations that you see are, they're just not there. But at least that's what it looks like to me when you, when you see this, this particular graph. Would you be able to maybe comment on someone who would say, you know, when I see this graph, I don't see any correlation between the two. So why are we worried about CO2? You know, temperature's been as high as 25C in the past. Now we're only around 15, 18C. CO2 levels have been 7,000 ppm. We're only at 400 now. Why are we worried? Uh, my answer to that is, if you want to live in Jurassic Park, go ahead. <laughs> so people, people who, um, who focus on, you know, an earth that's very old and goes back a long time. And they say, well, you know, back in the time of the dinosaurs or even further back, it was a lot warmer. Uh, I have a colleague here at my university who studies alligators who used to live at the North Pole. Here's the thing though. We didn't have people back then. We didn't have seven and a half thousand people with, like I was saying, you know, two thirds of the world's biggest cities within a few feet of sea level. We didn't have every acre of arable land on the planet already allocated. And we didn't already have all these massive inequalities where a small number of people are using too many of the world's resources. So if sea level rises three feet, where are people in those cities going to go? During the time of the dinosaurs, the area where I think three million people currently live would have been underwater at that time. We care about a change in climate because over the course of human civilization, our climate has been as stable as the temperature of a human body. And when our body starts to run a fever of one or two degrees, we start to take Tylenol, we start to monitor it, we head to the hospital if it goes too high. That's exactly what's happening to our planet today. We care about it because we're humans. The planet is going to survive. What's at risk today is civilization. Okay, we'll back. Hold on a sec. Uh, what do you think about geoengineering as, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a great question. So geoengineering is the idea of, of deliberately engineering the planet. Now, um, climate change is a form of accidental geoengineering. Uh, because we are already sort of accidentally engineering the planet. We're conducting an experiment like we've never done before. As far back as we can go, we've never seen this amount of carbon being poured into the atmosphere at this rate. No one, it's never happened before naturally. Um, but some of the responses people are thinking about are, what about mimicking the effect of a big volcanic eruption? Because when we have a huge volcanic eruption, it spews all the soot and dust high up into the atmosphere putting a reflective umbrella around the earth that for about a year or two on a big eruption for about a year or two that reflective umbrella actually reflects the sun's energy back into space and it temporarily cools down the earth so people are looking at could we spew on purpose massive amounts of dust and soot into the upper atmosphere and keep on going because if we just did it once it would fall out and keep on going so that we could put this man-made umbrella around the earth. It turns out that that would be a very effective way to lower our temperature. It would, but, but <laughs> it would not affect the changes in the rainfall patterns that we're seeing 
And it would also cut solar radiation to the planet. And you know what needs solar radiation? Plants and crops. So when they've had big volcanic eruptions in the past, there have been a year or two of famine following those eruptions because plants weren't getting enough energy from the sun. So geoengineering to me is kind of like as if everybody on the planet was running a low grade fever due to this new type of infectious disease like Zika 0.2. Say that you know Zika 0.2 infected everybody on the planet and scientists said, oh, well, we have an experimental drug that we've never tested. And we want to give that experimental drug to everybody on the planet at the same time. They don't know what the side effects are because you've never tested it before. So that's why geoengineering makes a lot of us very nervous because we know it would be effective at reducing temperature, but we're scared that the side effects might be worse. The cure might be worse than the problem. I got a hand up here and a hand back there. He's on your way to you. There you go. So, um, a comment I hear a lot about solar energy is that like solar panel, solar panels aren't very efficient, and that uh, we actually don't get as much energy as like people want you to think. Uh, could you just comment on that idea, please? That's a good question. Technology is changing really fast. So solar panels from 10 years ago were really not that great. It's totally true. But unless you read you know, journals and newsletters from the industry, from the solar panel industry, often we're not up to speed on the latest technology. And the latest technology is really something else. So Elon Musk, you probably heard of Elon Musk. He's the guy who decided to replace NASA. You know, NASA is renting space in his spaceships now. Um, Elon Musk has now, in his free time, um, invented these solar panels that look like shingles. You can get terracotta solar panels that look like terracotta shingles. You can get ones that look like slate shingles. You can get ones that look like normal shingles. And he's already built the factory to start producing them. And when he produces them, he expects them to cost about the same amount as a regular roof, which is insane. And then he's built this power wall thing that you put in your garage. It's a battery. For about three and a half thousand dollars, you put this battery in your garage and it stores all the energy that you get from your shingles. And then, of course, he's invented the Tesla, which is the electric car with the largest, largest range. I think it's currently about 250 miles you can drive on a single charge. It's still expensive. I don't have a Tesla, but it's getting cheaper and cheaper. You know, give us another, give them another five or 10 years. Um, and then you just, you know, you plug your Tesla into your garage powered by your solar shingles. I mean, the stuff that's happening is crazy. So they already have a solar road that they just built in Belgium to see how well that would work. And in Texas, solar energy is so cheap now that when Fort Hood, which is the biggest military base in the U.S., in, and it's in Texas, when Fort Hood was looking for a new electricity contract, they got all their bids, and the cheapest bid came from a solar and wind energy producer. And so by accepting that bid, they're actually saving $168 million uh, because that energy is so cheap. So your question is perfectly accurate for technology from about 10 years ago, but it's changing so fast. It is absolutely insane. So that's pretty cool. Um, in terms of like alternative energies, like it's kind of hard to kind of revive, so I wrote it down. Um, what are the risks of even more increased CO2 levels to get to a point where alternative forms of energy are finally sustainable? Because it kind of seems like to get to a point where we can use alternative forms of energy that will have to burn a whole lot more fossil fuels to get to that point. Like, do you happen to know what the risks of that are, or am I just in left field? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. I mean, um, you can power the factories that produce wind and solar energy. You can power those factories from wind and solar energy. Um, because it's just electricity. Um, if so, so that part of the you know technology is there. Um, the issue really is cost. And so for a long time, people have been saying, well, it's just too expensive. The reality is, is that now it's not. So across, I think Texas, Arizona, Nevada, and California, as well as across most of Australia too, wind and solar energy now is at the same below the cost of natural gas, which is pretty crazy. 
Um, and the price of solar energy dropped 25% in the last six months alone. So the price point is getting to be there. It won't be there in Michigan yet, but give it a couple more years and it will be there because the cost of producing this stuff is just dropping like a stone. Um, we're, I mean, it's, it's really amazing how fast things are changing, but the reality is, is that the fossil fuel industry has all the political clout right now and all the power, and they're the ones who are paying the politicians to say, oh, well, we have to shore up the coal industry when the reality is, is there's twice as many jobs in the solar energy industry, I think, than there is in the coal industry. Um, and it's growing much faster. So that's where the jobs are. That's where the clean energy economy is. And that's where China is. China has more wind and solar energy than any other country in the entire world. They're shutting down half-built coal plants in China now because they know that that's the cheapest way to get energy in the future. So the, the world is changing. The only issue from my perspective is we're not changing fast enough we're still producing too many of these heat trapping gases. We have to stop producing them faster than we are today. So I think my uh, question kind of speaks to what you're already uh, getting at here. It's, um, I read this book uh, recently called Money, Greed, and God, which um, speaks to environmental issues. Um, and it gives the example of a Englishman in the 18, late 1800s who um, predicted that in 50 years, the streets of London would be so filled with dung that it would be uninhabitable. Yeah. <laughs> and so, obviously 50 years later, the act actually the opposite happened. And so, the question it raises is how much do we rely on like supply and demand and advancement um, naturally versus uh, government regulation? Yes, that's totally true. Um... As, as one um, Saudi oil sheikh said, the, the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stone. The oil age is not gonna end because we run out of oil. It's gonna end because we figure out a better way to, to get our energy. So we can use our oil for other things because we actually use oil for a lot of stuff. I mean, I think in 50 years, people are gonna say, you used to burn oil, are you insane? Um, because there's only, there's only so much oil in the world and we use it in all kinds of plastics and other process, industrial processes. So, uh, th things are changing, uh, but things are changing within a market that is very skewed. We are not living in a free market. We are living in a market where certain types of energy are very heavily subsidized more than others. Now, you may think I'm talking about renewables, but I'm actually not. Renewables do have subsidies on them. And, you know, if you buy a certain type of electric car or a hybrid, you get money back in your taxes. But if you look at how much fossil fuels are subsidized, not just through direct subsidies, but through tax breaks and many other things, we are talking orders of magnitude higher subsidies for fossil fuels. So one of the ideas I've heard, and I try to remain pretty agnostic about solutions because I'm a scientist, I'm not a policy expert, but I like certain solutions. And one of the solutions I like comes from the Energy Enterprise Institute, which was founded by a guy called Bob Inglis, who is a Republican congressman and a Christian. And he founded this Enterprise Institute to look at uh, free market solutions to climate change. And one of the things Bob says is, let's take off all the subsidies off everything. Let's just take off all the subsidies. And then we'll see, you know, how the, um, you know, how things fall in that world. And I think we would see very rapid change if that happened. But at the same time, I would also say that if you take all the subsidies off everything, all of a sudden coal is no longer viable at all. And there are large numbers of people in very impoverished parts of the country that depend on coal for their living. So that's why I think serious consideration has to be made to retraining programs like they have right here in Texas, where they're taking people already who lost their job in the oil industry when oil prices spiked, not because of clean energy, but just because of what's going on over, you know, in, in the Middle East. Oil prices spiked, they lost their jobs, and the solar energy industry near, near San Antonio has built a retraining program to take people who've lost their jobs in oil and retrain them to do solar installations. Um, I was working with the, um, the state of Utah a while back and they were talking about how there's a, a town where coal is the industry. I mean, that's how people make their livings there. And they're saying, we can't shut down the coal mining unless we attract, say, a solar or wind manufacturer to build a factory there. And then we make sure that there is um, 
retraining and job hire, job creation for everybody who would lose their jobs in the coal industry first. Um, so these are the types of things I think we have to consider when we're looking to the future. Um, okay, so my question has to do with uh, natural gas because uh, people use it. They don't know if they as much, they always call it like another alternative form of energy and how it's cleaner and fracking. What's that dangerous for the environment? So, can you make a comment on natural gas as a form of energy and how it compares to oil, clean energy, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, natural gas burns a lot more cleanly than coal or oil. So it produces a lot less pollution and it's also much more efficient. It's at least twice as efficient. So for the same amount of electricity, you only get half the carbon emissions, which is really pretty good. So for a long time, natural gas is being talked about as a bridge fuel to kind of take us um, you know, from coal and oil through to, to renewables. And it has been a bridge fuel. It has bridged us for the last 10 years. But now I think its utility is starting to come to an end because again, in the southern United States, it is already more expensive than clean energy. It is still helping us bridge that gap in more northern states, but the end of the bridge, I think, is in sight. We're starting to see it. And down here, where they do a lot of the oil and gas extraction, fracking is actually pretty dangerous because it causes earthquakes. There have been earthquakes all through the, all through the state of um, Oklahoma that they've actually shown are being caused by reinjection of wastewater after fracking. So there's some serious issues, safety issues associated with fracking, um, but natural gas itself is definitely better than coal and oil, but we still are starting to near the end of its utility as well. So carbon dioxide is an issue for us with that extra blanket. And I know that um, it is used by plants. Is there, besides um, limiting our emission of carbon dioxide, is there, another way for us to kind of get rid of that blanket? That's a great question. So plants actually produce a lot of carbon dioxide, but they take up just as much as they produce. Humans produce a lot of it and we don't take any of it up. That's why we're wrapping this extra blanket on the planet. So there's definitely people looking at technology to see if we can suck it out of the air. They're looking at chemicals that react only with carbon dioxide so it would react with the carbon dioxide and bond with it. And then maybe we could turn it into like baking soda or something like that. Um, there's definitely technology they're looking at, but right now it's just really expensive because it doesn't produce anything that you can sell for a lot of money yet. But that is one of the serious considerations for the future. It's a great question. I, I have a question from some reading I've done. I've, I've read, I think Richard Muller from Berkeley wrote this, that the, the sea level rise that uh, we'll get as a result of the warming temperatures comes largely from water uh, increasing its volume as the, as the density drops and not so much landlocked ice melting. But is that true or is that way out in left field? No, for, for the last hundred years, sea level has risen about eight inches and the majority of the sea level rise we've seen in the last 100 years is because warmer water takes up more space. All of the extra heat that's being trapped by this blanket, 90% of that extra heat is actually going into the ocean. Only 10% is in the atmosphere. So with all that extra heat in the ocean, the oceans are heating up and they're taking up more space. And that is the main reason why we've seen sea level rise over the last century. But Sea level is now rising twice as fast today as it was 30 years ago. Sea level is rising exponentially. It is not linear. So in other words, we're not going to see another eight inches over the next hundred years. We're going to see anywhere from three to five feet over the next hundred years. And the reason for that exponential increase is the melting of land-based ice. It is accelerating, whether that land-based ice is on Greenland or on Antarctica or in mountain glaciers it is happening faster and faster. And so in the future, the main reason for sea level rise will not be thermal expansion. It is actually gonna be the melting of land-based ice because it's accelerating so fast. I think we've got time for one more question here.
Yes, that's a great question. That's why I did that little video I talked about glo my global weirding videos. And you can find those on YouTube under global weirding, or you can find them on my Facebook page. There are a lot of things you can do. And that's why I always encourage all my students to go, go online and look for a carbon calculator, like I talked about at the end. Because you can enter your life into the carbon calculator and actually tells you where your carbon footprint is coming from. And then it helps make choices to change it. So we've looked at our campus recycling program and all of the energy it saves when we recycle. And our dorms actually have competitions. We participate in Recycle Mania and we have a competition to see who can recycle the most. We look at what types of food choices we make. We've even looked at the carbon footprint of our outdoor recreation center. Um, and the trips that it, that it sponsors for students on campus. The best thing you can do is, is educate yourself on where your carbon emissions come from, and then any good carbon calculator will actually tell you the choices that you can make that are very personal choices, because everybody's life looks different than everybody else's. I think we should give a hand, Dr. Hayes.